Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you again to our previous panelists and all of our panelists today. It's been a fantastic day of discussions, uh, and I've really enjoyed it. So I hope you've had as much fun as I have. Uh, but we do have one more session this afternoon, a, 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 a side event uh, hosted by the Future of Privacy Forum. Uh, and so I am uh, very pleased to introduce the first side event of the 45th Global Privacy Assembly, conveniently located right here on the main stage. Uh, before I do so, I wanted to make one quick announcement, and that is if you got one of those translation packs downstairs, would you please return it at the end of the day, and you can check out another one tomorrow morning. Uh, our team will be releasing these packs as early as 8 o'clock uh, before our start time tomorrow, which is 8.30 a.m. So, uh, as Jules just mentioned, our topic here for this panel is the, uh, the issue of publicly accessible data. And this is a critical issue for our global community to consider uh, whether that data is collected and used by manual means or by automated means. Uh, so uh, I am delighted to turn things over uh, to Gabriella Zanfir Fortuna to lead this conversation. Thank you very much, Gabriella. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner. I think we're still waiting for two of our speakers, and here they are. Yes. Um, he is not a speaker. We, we started in a bit of, of a um, non-traditional way because we wanted to make sure we still have uh, you in the room that you're aware. No? How do I? Oh, sorry. Is what? Okay, perfect. Um, well, thank you very much for staying with us in the room. Uh, we know you were promised the last panel was the last panel, so this is the surprise <laughs> panel. Um, but I think uh, it, it will be a conversation that rounds up very, very nicely a lot of the things that we've heard about today throughout uh, the program of the conference. And um, one of the things we've um, heard about was how so many issues around AI are not actually that new under the sun. There are um, topics that uh, data protection and privacy, uh, the privacy community has been looking at for sometimes even 50 years now, right? Depending on how uh, we, from when we start the history of data protection law. So it is uh, absolutely my uh, pleasure and honor to bring this uh, extraordinary panel of experts from um, around the world, truly, to discuss one of the key, very specific issue, uh, issues that uh, are so relevant um, in, in this day and age, and that's uh, the protection of publicly available personal data. We know that uh, it is the source of many of the AI models being trained, uh, and we also know that um, even if it's public, this data is not truly free for all. So please allow me to introduce our panel of speakers. Uh, immediately next to me, we have uh, Tobias uh, Judin, the head of the International Department of the Norwegian Data Protection Authority. Thank you so much for joining us, Toby. Um, then we have Hilke Heimans. Um, who is currently the president of the litigation chamber and member executive uh, board of the Belgian Data Protection Authority. Thank you so much for joining us, um, Hilke. Uh, we also have today with us a president commissioner, uh, Blanca um, Lilia Ibarra from the INAI in Mexico. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. And um, we have commissioner Pansy Tlakula, from uh, South African uh, Personal uh, Data Protection Authority. Thank you very much for joining us. And then, uh, of course, Jules Polonetsky, um, uh, the Chief uh, Executive Officer of the Future of Privacy Forum, and my boss. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> very important. Um, <laughs> So uh, we were thinking to start off the conversation by asking uh, the question of 
what is it truly new about what we are seeing um, today when it comes to uh, publicly available personal data and collecting it from, uh, from uh, the internet? Wh wh what is it um, truly new? Have, have we encountered this same issue when we were dealing with search engines, for example? Um, how did data protection law deal with online search and what lessons can we learn from that? So uh, perhaps, Toby, I will uh, start with you. Okay, okay, that's fair. Am I, I'm mic'd up. Yes. Okay, that's good, that's good. So I would say that uh, many of the issues we're encountering are not necessarily new. Certainly, the legal framework is not at all new, right? So actually, under most jurisdictions, it appears that publicly available data, publicly accessible data, they are indeed subject to the safeguards of data protection regulation. Um, what is perhaps particularly interesting is that now um, publicly available data being used to train AI models, right? I think that is, that is maybe a new use case. Um, but we have seen for quite some time, uh, as you also referenced, Gabriela, that publicly available data is not open to use as you would please. There are certain uh, safeguards that need to be uh, in place and you need to have obviously a legal basis. Now, what we have been looking at recently in the GPA's International Enforcement Working Group is data scraping, which is the systematic collection of publicly available data for various purposes. And this could be authorized or unauthorized. And you might say that, for example, in, in the case of search engines, um, that is legitimate under certain, uh, let's say, uh, under certain conditions. So for example, yes, in, in, in the EU and in Europe, uh, search engines can in fact index information, but they need to respect it if data subjects have a valid reason to object to it. So for example, it could be that the information is outdated, it could be that the information is incorrect, defamatory, or that simply the individual's right to data protection outweighs um, the interest in making that information available in a search engine, which is, which is fine. But then you have AI models, and these models are trained on those data, and then if there's later a, an, an issue with the data, then what do you do? Because the model has already been trained with the data, and you cannot simply remove that one individual piece of personal data that it was trained on. You won't actually be able to retrieve it from the model itself, but you know that somehow, most likely, it continues to live on within, within the model. So this is certainly uh, one, one aspect which is, which is quite new. But over the last few years, we have also seen uh, a number of, we would say, um, data breaches pertaining to data scraping. Uh, and this is more the unauthorized, uh, very clearly unauthorized use of it. Um, so for example, many of you may perhaps remember there was a case regarding Facebook in 2021, where I think there was a database of 530 million people's personal data being traded on, on, on the internet. And there were accusa uh, accusations made that these data were um, collected um, or stolen from, from Facebook. What had actually happened is that someone had very cleverly used a contact importer uh, that Meta offered um, to its users, whereby you could find your contacts on, on Facebook and you could, not actually, could actually also sync your contact list with, with Facebook information. Uh, and what had happened is that some, some people had then kind of used this in order to just upload a, a number of, a, a vast uh, number of, of, of phone numbers to, to Facebook, um, and then getting back the publicly, inf uh, publicly accessible information from their Facebook profiles. So that could be obviously full name, it could be phone number, it could be other contact details, it could be other uh, pieces of information from, from their profile. And this was being used for very uh, unexpected purposes. And again, you know, this is subject to data protection, protection law. So what the International uh, Enforcement Working Group of the GPA did uh, on the 24th of August this year is that we actually issued uh, a, a public statement on this, on data scraping, specifically just pointing out the fact that this is subject to data protection law 
and you have to have measures in place to prevent, to detect, and to respond to unauthorized data scraping. Um, and this, this was actually also sent to a number of the largest platforms uh, in this sphere. So a, lo a lot of the big tech companies, and we have actually received responses from them as well, uh, at least most of them, outlining how they are working to specifically uh, prevent, detect, and respond to, to unauthorized data scraping. Thank you so much for, for um, this overview. Uh, oh. Thank you for, uh, for this overview. And I was wondering whether um, anyone uh, else among the panel would like to weigh in. Uh, I know Jules certainly has some thoughts about what is old and what is new in this debate. And, and, uh, but first, we will go to uh, Hilke. Well, I don't want to be first uh, if uh, Jules wants to go. But uh, I would say that the use of publicly available uh, information has always been part of data protection law. For, for initially, I think for a good reason, the why reason for me is important because also for publicly available uh, information, there is a need for control by the individual. Uh, when I look back to, this, to the European jurisdiction, the European Court of Justice already, 15 years ago, had a, had a Finnish case which it dealt with, was, was about the use of taxation data. In, in Finland, taxation data can be, uh, are publicly available, but it's not available to exploit this data by putting it in, a, by making commercial use of this information, because people are not expecting this and should not expect this. The, there, there is a right to be to have certain control over your data, and that means, for instance, that you have that you can expect that data which is available on the internet is not be used for commercial purposes, for whatever purposes at, at all. Second reason, apart from control, and I think that's also looking back to the case law of the Court of Justice, but also more in general, is the aspect of the risks of using publicly information, publicly available information. That's, of course, enormously much more apparent in, in the time of AI, but also long before we talked about AI, we talked about profiling, for instance. Profiling is, if you think about the reason why people need to be protected or need protection or want protection, at least, is the fact that you don't wish to be profiled on basis of information which is everywhere available. If you look at the case law of the Court of Justice, it's even the main reason why the Court of Justice, in its number of cases in the, in the, in the 2010s, let's say, emphasized constantly that the risk of profiling is the reason why data protection has such a big importance. The right to data protection, the right to privacy. So that's changing, that, that, but that's also not new. Of course, now we come in, an, in a new era, era where we have to deal with AI, with training data, with all the elements which uh, has been uh, uh, alluded by, by Tobias. But I think it's important to keep in mind that what we do is not new. And a discussion about data protection covering publicly available information is not new at all. And it's an important, it's a crucial element of what we are doing, basically. It's a starting statement. Thank you so much, uh, Hilke, for, for this comment. And um, you um, brought up uh, the, CG, the Court of Justice uh, of the EU case from 15 years ago already, hmm. uh, looking at um, how the directive was applying to uh, publicly available personal data. And this reminds me of what we've heard earlier today from Kashmir Hill. Uh, about uh, the Clearview AI um, uh, case uh, and, and how um, Im images scraped online were the core to, uh, of, of uh, that. Um, but, but see, we were able, uh, relying on uh, the GDPR in the EU, to um, have decisions of the protection authorities against uh, Clearview AI. And this part of it, uh, the training on publicly available personal data and uh, unlawfulness, uh, the lack of a lawful ground for processing, uh, was part of, of that. Um, Jules, did you want to weigh in on uh, the what is old and what is new question when we're looking at publicly available personal data? 
Well, clearly a lot of this is already, I'd say, reasonably um, settled case law in jurisdictions that have privacy protections for public data. We've had data brokers who've collected data uh, and uh, used it maybe for anti-fraud, maybe for marketing, and there's case law and restrictions on this. We have the well-known search decision where we've got you know, uh, uh, the BCJ uh, in the end of the day determining that, yes, of course, data protection rights are applicable in terms of deletion and so on and so forth, but that there is a substantial interest for uh, you know, internet users in their data being used to provide search results. So, uh, and we've got uh, machine learning, which didn't just uh, exist uh, today or yesterday. Um, uh, the databases that have been put together, um, many of them that have been used for the leading LLMs uh, were put together by not-for-profits that wanted an alternative to only the biggest web engines and crawlers having uh, um, you know, a, an access to a database of the entire uh, web. And so um, I think we're eager to see how this particular use is assessed as a particular risk that might go too far or might not go too far. Um, uh, I suspect uh, we'll see you know, conclusions that, um, um, that training a model is indeed in a certain uh, interest, but that you indeed have rights to suppress data or to uh, take any other actions against it. Um, in the US, it's a bit more complicated a situation. Um, uh, people probably saw during the whole right to be forgotten debate, sort of the US folks all saying, oh, First Amendment, First Amendment. But even there, it's quite complicated. We've got a long range of court cases that have uh, you know, considered access to data to be part of speech. You have to know information in order to, uh, uh, to speak. Um, and so we've seen courts skeptical when uh, restricting access to um, uh, data, even requiring that maybe you identify yourself as you know, a, a hurdle that you might need to bypass, um, but yet supporting it when it's narrow and focused. Well, we don't want youth to access you know, porn sites and so forth, when it's been you know, tailored appropriately. Earlier today, you heard some discussion of the, um, uh, of, of the recent uh, case in California that um, struck down, at least uh, in this point of the process, the uh, law intending to um, uh, require um, uh, you know, uh, youth-appropriate uh, sites. And Claudia Berg, who was moderating, said, well, was it really all First Amendment, or was the law crafted a bit awkwardly? And it is indeed perhaps the case that if the law was crafted maybe a bit more narrowly tailored, it might or might not uh, survive that scrutiny. But we definitely come with a strong default view. Even the ACLU, who are typically very strong privacy advocates, but very strong First Amendment advocates, typically will oppose laws that have um, privacy restrictions applied to public data because they see it as in uh, the necessary public interest. There's even a very well-known case where the ACLU and one of their partners was scraping data um, to look for tenants who were being subject to eviction procedures and who maybe didn't even know or didn't know who to turn to. And these advocates would use this data to then reach out to the tenant and say, do you need legal counsel? You know, we want to help you. And so they brought a case against the state, uh, I think it was uh, South Carolina, which didn't like this scraping uh, and tried to restrict it. And they prevailed in court because it, you know, it was indeed their right to seek this information. So we've seen the current set of federal proposals and, and some of the state laws try to nuance this. Um, the ones that have tried to be careful uh, have just excluded uh, public data. So many of the state proposals and some of the federal proposals, uh, although they're proposing to provide you know, broad protections for um, uh, data, have very clearly said data that's been made public is excluded because they don't want to get caught by this First Amendment risk. Others have tried to be a bit more nuanced, and they've said, well, if the data was expressly made public by the individual, that's one thing. But if it's been made public maybe without your, you know, uh, your direction or without your knowledge, or maybe the government made it public because it's in a, you know, a, a, a filing of you know, homeowners or others, uh, then not. And those are likely where we'll see some court challenges um, but a little bit more of a challenge because of the broad First Amendment protection and the, the challenge of uh, tailoring appropriately. 
The last thing I'll mention is we had a very prominent Supreme Court case, um, IMS Health, a company that uh, uh, uses um, um, uh, medical data, um, and particularly had a business model, uh, one of its lines, uh, around um, what kinds of prescriptions do doctors prescribe. So that pharma company said, well, hey, this doctor never prescribes any of our medicine. Let's go educate them about you know, why they should be aware. And so their database of prescriptions, but not your prescription, but what collectively particular doctors, uh, are they big or small uh, prescribers of certain medications, the court found that a law that targeted that use, that sort of marketing use, um, was too uh, tailored to prevent a certain kind of speech. Even though it was sort of a commercial speech, a law that was crafted to say, no, this data could be available, maybe for research or all sorts of other purposes, but not for marketing in this manner was struck down as unconstitutional. So we've got a bit of a, maybe we're a bit of an outlier, although it might be the case that some other jurisdictions you know, also uh, don't have this particular restriction, but see a strong public interest in the data being available, therefore making it you know, <laughs> legitimate or, or having other legal basis. Uh, absolutely, and um, in fact, this is one of the tensions that we were about to go into, uh, the tension between the public interest in having access to publicly, well, to uh, personal information as well, if not information overall, and uh, the privacy protection imperatives. And um, uh, two of our commissioners here on the panel uh, are in fact uh, wearing two hats. They're also commissioners that have to protect um, openness and uh, freedom of information within their jurisdictions, uh, while at the same time, they're the privacy protection commissioners. So President Commissioner Ibarra, if I may uh, turn to you now, and also flagging for, for our audience that um, you might want to use the, the device, the translation device, if possible. Uh, so uh, what, what, what is your uh, experience um, having to balance your two mandates to uh, protect personal information, but at the same time ensure that the public has access to uh, specific information that might be personal as well? Muchas gracias. En efecto, las agencias que protegemos datos personales, como es el caso de México, tenemos que atender el equilibrio eh, que representa, por un lado, la apertura de la información pública que eh, tiene un interés genuino y legítimo de la sociedad en general y por otro lado la debida protección de los datos personales y en ese sentido estamos hablando entonces de dos caras de una misma moneda donde existe como ya lo señala una tensión natural entre entregar y abrir la información que está contenida en aquellas bases de datos, aquellos documentos que manejan los gobiernos o las instituciones públicas y aquello que tiene interés el ciudadano de conocer. En el caso particular, y tiene que ver naturalmente con las legislaciones de cada país, en el caso de México, por ejemplo, yo quiero hablar de la prueba de interés público que realizamos y que practicamos cuando enfrentamos alguna digamos, solicitud de información, alguna negativa para entregar esa información, o bien cuando existe inconformidad por la información que se entregó de manera incompleta. Lo que hacemos no solamente, por un lado, se trata de ponderar aquello que debe de ser público mediante la prueba de interés público que se hace y donde se practica una ponderación y se advierte que, por un lado, ciertamente está la libertad de información, el derecho para que se pueda conocer la información que corresponde al ámbito público, y por otro lado está la debida protección de los datos personales. En ese sentido, eh, bueno, pues se determina, por un lado, la pertinencia que tiene el divulgarse esa información, y por otro lado, si debe de prevalecer, eh, digamos, cerrado y no entregarse esos datos personales que muchas veces eh, pueden corresponder a empresas o a personas físicas, como nosotros eh, llamamos, que tuvieron algún tipo de negocios o alguna, digamos, interlocución en, en el gobierno. Es importante eh, aquí poder considerar que lo ideal es que siempre exista un consentimiento informado. No obstante ello, estimamos que siempre 
habrá que hacer esa ponderación y debida valoración entre lo que debe de ser público y el, me el menor daño que se puede causar cuando se entrega información de carácter personal. I just want to note that the AI-powered live translate, for those who don't have headsets, oh. <laughs> actually did a very nice job creating a live oh, trans, uh, transcription of your comments. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so there is some value to this AI stuff. Oh, okay. great. <laughs> Thank you for that, Jules. And um, I'm, I'm uh, hearing uh, a lot uh, from uh, the, the um, President Commissioner's uh, comments how important the balancing act um, yeah. in between that public interest in having access to specific data um, while at the same time protecting against uh, harm if you're giving access to specific personal data is, is so important. And you were talking about um, how we're looking at the, uh, at the two faces of the same coin. Yeah. So that's, uh, that, um, thank you for, for those comments. Uh, Commissioner Tlahula, um, how uh, is the situation uh, in South Africa in the sense of we know that the data protection law is not that uh, old, uh, POPIA, uh, at the same time it, it, it provides protections for publicly available personal data um, and, and also please do comment on that duality in between uh, public interest uh, in access to information and protecting the privacy of information. Okay, thank you very much for having me on, on this panel. As you have correctly pointed out, uh, our organization, the Information Regulator, is a new, relatively new organization. And we also have a dual mandate like Mexico, which is data protection and um, access to information. And the law specifically states that uh, as we promote and protect the right to privacy, we must always balance it against the free flow of information and other rights, including freedom of expression. So we always have to do that balancing act. And maybe what is new, I, I want to start with what is new and what is old. Of course, data protection authorities and ours as well, we are correctly concerned with the observance of the right to privacy and data protection in relation to publicly available um, uh, personal information and personal information that has been deliberately made public. I'll talk about that. And uh, I think the flip side, what we are beginning to see on the continent is the movement for uh, making, for, for intermediaries to make um, information public for the public good, for development purposes, um, for also dealing with what we are all concerned about, disinformation, research on disinformation, which is the big, one of the biggest threats to democracy particularly as it relates to elections, taking into consideration that uh, I'm told that this year, more than 90 countries globally are going to be holding elections and disinformation uh, and misinformation, as we know, um, is a threat to our democracy. So researchers want these uh, intermediaries to make um, that information available for research purposes. And also, you find that even startup uh, NGOs, startup uh, organizations also want that information uh, for business purposes. And uh, these intermediaries, as we know, have collected a lot of information over the years. So, and that is where, and as you know, that uh, in other countries, in Europe, for instance, if I am correct, I'm told that there's already a code of conduct in that respect where this uh, uh, information has to be made available subject, of course, to the observance of privacy. So with us, and in Africa, this debate is, is starting, but an organization such as mine that is dealing with both privacy and access to information, we are called upon. Not too long ago, there was a conference in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia where this uh, uh, issue was discussed of intermediaries making 
information accessible for the public good. But you must remember that in that information, there's also personal information. So if a, an organization like mine participates in so, those kinds of discussions, we have to ensure that while we promote openness, transparency, access to information, we must ensure that that is done in a way that also protects privacy and data, as if, if, that, if the information includes personal information. So we find that all the time we have to, to do that balancing act, and sometimes it's quite difficult. Uh, thank you very much for, for sharing your perspective. Um, I, I would w want to go back to Hilke, perhaps, um, because um, you also have such a deep experience in research in data protection law, and, and uh, let, let's say the foundations of data protection law. Um, we hear that publicly available personal data can be processed for purposes that are absolutely legitimate. And you gave one example with the taxation data. Now we're hearing about research into misinformation and so forth. But uh, when we apply purpose limitation, right? So I was wondering whether you can um, tell us what are some of the specific targeted protections uh, in um, the GDPR, in European Union's data protection law? Um, how are we looking at some very specific issues like local grounds for processing, um, giving notice to people? Uh, is notice even effective if we're taking the information out uh, of the internet, out from the public domain? Um, any comments? Uh, I know it's a very generous question, uh, but uh, please. I'm happy to improvise, and uh, it's of course an area where I work on for years, so true. When I talked uh, here about public data and the pub personal data and the public good, it reminds me of all discussions we were having with, uh, with uh, medical research, where uh, there are completely different views on this, whether or not at the end of the day your personal data is, uh, belongs to you, let's say, so you are supposed to give consent before your data is used for, for medical research. On the other hand, uh, when you work in research, you note that if you want to bring medical research further, you need, uh, you need personal data, you need to have personal information, also in some, uh, some cases about patients. This is a discussion which, at least in, when you talk with specialists in that area, you note how different the feelings are and how emotional the feelings can be. The fact that you as individuals should be able, could be able to stop progress of medical research is something which is for some people very difficult to, to, to swallow, let's say. Whereas on the other hand, uh, we have, uh, yeah, there is the foundation of control, of fairness, etc foundation that you as individual should be entitled to have a certain limit of control over your personal information is completely different, uh, an opposite uh, uh, argument, an opposite basis. Uh, uh, in the end of the day, we always find solutions for, for anything, and I think there might be situations where, where uh, consent or is not necessarily the basis for all further processing. For instance, if it really can, if, if, if this really can very, very well further help to uh, improve medical research. But that would not mean that I would say that your personal data is part of the public good as such. Uh, to make a philosophical uh, remark. Stating a bit in this area, a recent case we dealt with, not as fundamental as what I just said, but was was a was a case of a website that had scraped uh, data from uh, hospitals, from, from all the med from, from doctors and other, other medical professions, scraped this information and made this into a nice website which made it easier to, to book appointments, etc. They had done this without the consent of the doctors. We got a complaint on this, and then we said, we said, as a medical professional, you may expect that the hospital where you work or the medical institution where you work publishes your, 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 your specialities and your, your, your skills, but not that the third party does it and makes money from this. So there we said this kind of 
uh, this website is is fully uh, is 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 lawful what they want, but there should be consent. And that was also based on the fact that here the balancing for us was that there is no real prof need, no real need for uh, for society to make use of this information. You can there's all way, uh, all other ways possible. And as a as a medical professional, you may expect that uh, you have control of how you how how. Uh, how you ha have your contacts with, with patients and what, how your information is being used. So in that case, we said the, protect, the right to data protection of the medical professionals prevailed. Just to mention a few things, that's not simply only making money with, with, with publicly available data. The other thing is when you use and enhance the quality of this data, for instance, by on the basis of data scraping, offering certain services, combining information, etc. And then, then, of course, the the story becomes a different one. I don't know if that's an answer to your question. Um, in Europe, we always speak about legitimate interest and the balancing of different interests. Uh, we can talk a lot about it, but uh, maybe in the... Uh, it, it is certainly an answer, an answer to the question. Um, I would like to go to uh, Toby. Perhaps you want to add uh, some, some ideas to this. Um, and then we can look into one specific um, question that I had for the panel, in fact, which is whether data protection by design, data protection by default, privacy by design, can help in any uh, way maintaining this balance um, when processing personal uh, data as publicly available. Mm. That is a very good question indeed. One thing that strikes me right now is that we're talking about, okay, so you need to balance data protection with transparency for you know, purposes that are in the public good. But what we are now increasingly seeing is forms of technology that doesn't necessarily serve a specific purpose, their general purpose, such as generative AI, foundation models, right? And so I think the issue of purpose specification is, is, is really key here. Because when, when you essentially scrape these data and say, well, they can be used for anything, but they could also be used for good things, and therefore this is, this is totally above board and it's fine. I, I think you encounter some, some fundamental issues because you could also employ it in ways which are very, very bad for individuals. So for example, you could use it in order to orchestrate cyber attacks, you know, phishing, social engineering. You could use it for um, building uh, biometric uh, facial scan databases such as Clearview AI, PMIs, you can use it for identity fraud, you can use it for a number of purposes. Uh, and I think that the vaguer your purpose is, the more of an issue you have in terms of legally collecting those data. And I also think that if you have a, a high level of data protection, if you're being re very restrictive in terms of how these data can be used, then people are actually more likely to accept transparency because then they trust that the data will only be used for purposes that are acceptable, but also, very importantly, purposes that they can reasonably expect. So again, speaking to the um, combination, unexpected combination of data for, 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 for use cases that are not really envisaged, uh, I, I think purpose specification is key here. And, and it shows how data protection can actually aid uh, transparency because data protection essentially increases the level of trust. So, so I, you know, the, the data protection and transparency is not always working against each other. They can actually also be mutually beneficial to one another. And then looking at how data protection by design and default can, can help. You know, you have a, you have a number of services um, that from a business point of view seek to increase engagement. They seek to increase uh, social relations. They seek to uh, just get you essentially addicted and hooked to a service. So everything in these services is kind of designed with that in mind. So that is the purpose. The purpose is not really necessarily, I would argue, to maintain that high level of data protection. Instead, data protection is added at a later stage as more of an afterthought. Or, you know, some compliance officer says, hey, you know, there's some legislation in this jurisdiction. Can we do something to just please the regulators? And that is completely the wrong uh, 
strategy to take because you can't necessarily fix the issues at that point in time. So for example, in terms of what you can do to prevent data scraping, I mean, so let's say that you're social media and then you have all of these publicly accessible information that people posted on, on their profile. If you have data protection by design default in mind, it would perhaps to make sense to limit how many profiles a new user can see within the first month, for example. Or you could also have measures in place to monitor, you know, if, if a certain user accesses 10,000 profiles within a day, okay, a, an alarm bell should be ringing because that is not normal user behavior and that is not necessarily user behavior that we want to see. It is suggestive of, you know, bot behavior, for example. You could look at who is accessing the service. Is a large number of requests being made from a certain group of IP addresses? Well, that is also indicative of bot behavior. So from that point of view, if you have data protection in mind when designing the service, you could actually uh, implement measures that can deter and detect these kinds of things. And it is so much easier to do that on, on that level than to respond afterwards and say, well, now we have this massive PR scandal where data originating from our platform is being traded on the dark web. Uh, or where we need to engage in, in, in uh, litigation against websites that have scraped our data. I mean, that would just try to kind of, let's say, fix the, the damages caused by the fire rather than to actually prevent the fire from starting in, in the first place. Uh, th thank you for sharing um, uh, this view, but particularly for bringing in very concrete examples and, and possible measures um, th that's uh, really appreciated. Um, pr President Commissioner Ibarra, would you want to weigh in on the question of uh, privacy by design, uh, measures that would be helpful to be implemented to um, protect uh, publicly available personal data? Gracias. Desde luego que sí. Eh, me rescato dos conceptos importantes que se acaban de mencionar. Uno que tiene que ver con la prevención y creo que los temas de que estamos hablando sobre sistemas eh, del ciclo de vida de los datos personales eh, tienen que advertir no solamente el contexto, la finalidad y el objetivo para el uso de los datos personales, la naturaleza, los fines del tratamiento de los mismos. Y ahí es donde entra también esa prevención que es necesaria en esta etapa del diseño, de la privacidad por diseño. Rescato también lo que ya refieren de la confianza, porque por un lado, en efecto, se trata de que la información que se abre al público la información que se recaba a partir de datos personales para ayudar en investigaciones médicas, en investigaciones científicas, sea fidedigna, pero al mismo tiempo pueda contener aquella precisión en los datos que puedan llevar a resolver un asunto o a proponer alguna acción específica. Creo que es importante y lo trabajamos en los institutos eh, que tenemos esa misión de proteger datos personales y al mismo tiempo de impulsar la transparencia, no solamente de aplicar el marco normativo vigente, sino también de trabajar sobre distintas medidas con un fin preventivo para evitar el uso indiscriminado y ya se mencionaba justamente eh, el diseño que se debe de trabajar tiene que ver con la minimización de aquella, aquellos datos, es decir, la reducción en la extensión del tratamiento de los datos personales, limitar también los plazos quizá para los cuales están expuestos o la conservación y accesibilidad de los mismos, el consentimiento informado del cual también ya hemos hecho referencia, pero eh, consideramos también que conviene hablar de una evaluación del impacto, es decir, aquello que permite analizar cuando se pone al público bases de datos, qué impacto puede tener eh, esa información que se está, digamos, abriendo hacia el público. Y eh, en esto tenemos que considerar un principio que es el deber de seguridad, también que deben de estar considerados por las acciones para que se puedan adoptar 
las medidas técnicas, no solamente de control, sino eventualmente, por supuesto, de prevención y ya en un caso extremo, pues un control de daños, porque creo que no hemos hablado de eso. ¿Qué pasa cuando se exponen las grandes bases de datos sin consentimiento y que éstas no tienen un fin específico, sino que más bien ese uso puede ser irregular o puede afectar a terceros? Creo finalmente que es importante que hoy enfoquemos también eh, nuestras agencias en impulsar esquemas de privacidad por diseño y seguir esos sistemas y procedimientos tanto normativos como preventivos que puedan evitar que cuando se traspasan esas bases de datos fuera de la región, fuera del país, también estén instrumentadas las medidas de seguridad necesarias para evitar la dispersión de los mismos. Thank you very much for highlighting the importance of a precautionary approach uh, and, and for bringing in uh, the, the topic of an impact assessment that can be done before particular databases um, are made uh, public or are made available to the public. Uh, Commissioner Tlapula, would you want to add um, your thoughts about specific measures that organizations can take uh, to prevent perhaps data scraping or to, um, if there are specific privacy by design measures um, that you would see useful in, in uh, these cases? Yes, I think so. I think also if you look at uh, situations like ours where the legislation is outdated, I mean, it was adopted in 2013, and it has been, I mean, if you look at AI regulation and you look at our legislation, it's probably no longer fit for purpose. But I don't think we can then sit back and say we're waiting for the legislatures to amend the legislation before we deal with innovations like AI. And I think, in my view, that's where privacy by design probably can, you know, apply as a stop gap measure so that any design that is, uh, any innovation or any design should um, have privacy embedded in it. That's the first thing to say. And also what uh, my sister here has said, to say the second thing is to ensure that a privacy impact assessment is also conducted before any design is uh, actually done and before it is even rolled out. And to apply other principles, you know, of uh, data protection to ensure that uh, principles of minimality uh, you know, are also applied that you don't um, process more information that you, than you need. Issues of accountability also are also taken into consideration. So I'm saying that in the meantime, because I was listening to the discussion before this, the, the panel before this one to say our, our laws are outdated, most of us, uh, but let's, let's use the principles that are there to deal with uh, innovations such as AI as we're waiting for lawmakers to, to amend the laws. Thank you very much for that contribution, which um, highlights just how many common uh, features uh, the, le the legal regimes we, we have been talking about have when looking at these issues. Um, everyone mentioned data minimization, everyone mentioned uh, impact assessments, um, purpose limitation principles to be applied. And, and we, we are looking at countries uh, and jurisdictions literally from uh, all around the world. Uh, before we're opening it up for questions, Jules, do you want to round up uh, with a comment or a, a reflection uh, after the conversation? Well, I feel that the people in this audience are saying, okay, is your conclusion that the current large language models that are getting all this attention and creating this big revolution, many of which were trained on all the data on the internet, um, need to be banned or shut down or assessed in a way that fails 
the restrictions that were in place. And so um, that may be a challenge for some of the regulators to specifically answer because they've, they've got uh, uh, investigations or cases and so forth. But if I was going through the thinking, I would be saying a few things, right? I would say, well, did they actually seek to avoid personal information in terms of you know, lists and databases and so forth? And I know a number of them have said that, yes, they've, they've, uh, you know, if, if they came across or come across you know, lists of names, this is not what the language model is trying to learn. Um, OK. Clearly, there's still a lot of personal information in a blog text on Reddit and Wikipedia and so on and so forth. Um, so then the second thing I think that they would argue was, well, we may have learned by reading this data, but our model actually doesn't have personal information in the model. We have scores and we have you know, alignments, and yes, we can we can create personal information, and we should have all the rules around that, but our model itself doesn't contain personal information. I'm still trying to get my head a little bit around it. I have a globally unique name, for better or worse, Jules Polonetsky, and so um, somewhere in the language systems of the world is some statistical correlation that when Jules and Polonetsky appear, well, they're often together if you, you type them in, and privacy or data protection is highly correlated uh, you know, with it. And this knowledge, um, is this knowledge, leaving aside maybe public figure or not, right? Let's assume it's you know, the obscure Jules Polonetsky. Um, is the model containing personal information? My understanding is that the LLM companies say, no, it's knowledge about words, right? It's proper names, it's proper nouns, it's, it's R, it's the, it's biology, it's Polonetsky, there's a lot of Polonetskys. And so I think it creates this interesting intellectual question about what is personal data because it's, you know, I always assumed a model is just, you know, code, but here you have a score for every word in the universe. Their legal view is not, and perhaps, you know, regulators will, will engage, you know, um, uh, with this. So I, I think we're taking little steps. I think we also heard that assuming personal information is processed, it matters what the purpose is. And obviously, a search engine can be used for a lot of things. It's pretty general. But these seem to be used for everything and anything. So somebody could make some assessment as to whether or not processing for advancing technology in this like magic way is sort of a general public you know, good that, that falls in a legitimate interest, even though it can be applied in so many different uh, ways. So that's my little sort of snapshot uh, on, um, on where it stands today, which is likely we aren't going to see a regulator opine that the general use technology, if trained in the way that has described, needs to be shut down. Maybe one bold one would, but it certainly would create lots of uh, earth-shattering repercussions. And I suspect the focus then will be on the issues we talked about applying the restrictions around what is output, indeed being sure that the data was legally collected, not from stolen data, maybe open source data and restrictions around that, uh, maybe restrictions around data that shouldn't have been scraped because it, the people were told, hey, your data might be public, but it's really only so people can you know, communicate with you, not so that it can be used in other purposes. Well, uh, aren't we lucky because we have a, a, a number of regulators here that we can just uh, put on the spot. No, I'm joking. Uh, I, I actually um, looked at, at uh, Toby and he, he wanted to uh, respond to one of your points. Uh, so I'm not putting him on the spot. Don't worry if we invite you for a panel. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think Jules did, a, did an excellent job at really uh, explaining what the core issue here is. And it kind of asked the question, didn't you, Jules? Will regulators say that now the model contains personal data and it needs to be deleted and it needs to start anew? Obviously, we don't have right now a clear stance on this, but um, I think there are three words that are very important here, and those three words are model inversion attacks. Where you have kind of seen that you can, to a certain extent, regenerate the training data that the model was trained on, right? So that does signify that even though personal data is not stored in a form that we recognize, it is not necessarily the case that the model itself does not contain personal data. 
And what if those personal data were incorrect? What if they were unlawfully collected? A regulator might still say, okay, you need to do whatever is necessary to rectify or delete those data. And if you have then obviously made a design choice whereby, well, you can't do that without completely scrapping the model, I don't think it could be ruled out that someone could be asked to completely scrap their model, right? And, and, and obviously, yes, there would be repercussions to this, but I think that right now, a lot of companies are just trying to be first, just trying to get their model out there, trying to get people addicted to the technology, because the longer, the longer we use the technology, the, the less inclined we will be to kind of say, okay, we, we can live without it for, for a period of time. But I think that the jury is very much still out on this. And from our point of view, we're not ruling anything out. I'm not saying that we would take such a drastic measure, but we're certainly not ruling it out. And just signifies how important it is to actually think before you scrape and not scrape and then think. <laughs> think before uh, you scrape, yeah. I, I, we are giving here a fair opportunity. So uh, if a, any one of the, the panelists would want to respond to any of these points, I'm very happy to give you the floor. Or we can uh, go to questions from the public. I mean, I'm not responding as such. I, I, I'm just this this issue of, of data scraping. Um, depending on what you use the information for, if it's a researcher researching for disinformation, huh? um, my point really is that unless these intermediaries make information accessible to researchers, for instance, for people who want to look at disinformation, data scraping will happen. Or those researchers who want to deal with disinformation, I'm using that because I think disinformation is the biggest threat to our democracy. I have to repeat this and underline it. These uh, data scrapers, if I can call it them that, they will go to brokers to get the information. So we need to solve that problem to ensure that these intermediaries make the data available, provided it's publicly available and provided it does not uh, include personal information or if it does, privacy, uh, they have to ensure that uh, the privacy principles apply to protect personal information. It looks to me that that is what is new going forward for, for, from where I come from. Maybe in other parts of the world, these issues have been uh, dealt with. But, but that's why your voice is so important. And this is why we wanted to, to include your voice in the panel, because we want to uh, discuss um, all of these uh, very specific issues uh, around the world. I'm not so sure that the issues you mentioned are so specific only for your region. I think it's very wise what you say and very uh, thoughtful. Uh, when I think about this area, it always comes to me about back to what uh, Toby already said, to purpose limitation or, or maybe uh, processing for the public good. And there, I think the main uh, question remains and will never be solved. What is the public good? What is in the public good? Uh, maybe we can ask for a nice policy paper of FTF <laughs> on this. <laughs> Definitely, I would like to do that. But in the end of the day, we always end up in on this discussion. But what is the public good? It, it depends from day to day, from, from area to area. Uh, today, I had a discussion on, on, the, on the use of, on, on children's data where the question was whether or not parents should have control over, over, the, uh, over the processing by, over the access by, their, by their teenagers. Well, those questions, we, we don't even have an answer on. So the question remains, what is the public good? Uh, that doesn't help very much, but I hope the, the policy paper by FPF will. Uh, secondly, last point I would like to make is uh, one thing we should always keep in mind and that we, not, we should not put public access to and privacy as a dichotomy. They are not two opposite things. They can strengthen each other, provided that we, do, we use all the tools which are there, like Toby already nicely pointed out, the impact assessment, etc., etc. That's what I would say. Thank you so much.
Gracias. Eh, bueno, si me permiten, eh, yo también coincido que no debemos de hacer, eh, digamos, mirar eh, la información pública, lo que buscamos de la transparencia del trabajo en el sector público versus eh, la información que se da a partir de las bases de datos personales que manejan las instituciones públicas. Naturalmente hay un interés legítimo y genuino para crear políticas públicas que se basen en información fidedigna y donde se puede encontrar esa vía para un tratamiento adecuado en el manejo de los datos que se recaban de la población en general. No obstante, si sí, ese modelo de apertura de la información no puede dejar de lado el respeto a otro derecho humano que es el de proteger los datos personales de la población. Y es ahí donde, envueltos en ese mar de desinformación que ya refería eh, nuestra amiga, es donde tenemos que encontrar cuáles son las mejores estrategias tecnológicas también, no solamente el marco legal y normativo que se establece en nuestras regiones, sino la forma en que tiene que haber, digamos, un blindaje específico en aquello que traspasa eh, esa línea de lo público y lo privado. Yo creo que eh, hay muchos retos por delante porque va más rápida la tecnología, los avances que vivimos y la inteligencia artificial como también está invadiendo ese espacio de acción personal, interno, privado, y donde quedan entonces también otros principios de integridad, de ética, en el manejo de los datos, en las nuevas tecnologías y en aquello que ciertamente tiene un fin político, comercial, económico, que no necesariamente va de la mano con lo que requiere una sociedad en general. Entonces, hay que analizar cuál es el, el bien público, cuál es el bien social, cuál es el beneficio directo para la población y establecer aquellos mecanismos normativos, pero también aquellos sistemas electrónicos que blinden el espacio privado de la gente. Uh, thank you so much for, for that comment uh, that rounds up our conversation uh, quite well and outlines the complexity of thinking about these issues, both with uh, organizational technical measures, not only uh, solutions that we find uh, in, in the legislation. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, now we do have time for um, a couple of questions, if there are questions in the public. And yes, I see questions. I'm very excited about that. Uh, there are three questions. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah. Thank you. And if you could just introduce yourself um, before the question. Sure. Ben Rapp from Securus. <clears throat> this is uh, d directed, and I'm very grateful that you're here, to Ms. Tlacula. Uh, we have a big practice across Southern Africa, and one of the things that we find difficult is reconciling the inclusion in personal data in Popia of data relating to juristic persons. <laughs> so when we think about balancing the public interest against privacy rights, how do you reconcile that when we're talking about information on companies and associations and clubs and things like that rather than people? <laughs> Should I, I, I'm laughing because we are grappling with that uh, protection of personal information of, of juristic persons, and no, I just want to be upfront that not being the lawmaker, um, I'm not sure what informed that, but to be just upfront with you is that that matter we are still grappling with and we have not even come to it yet as a new organization. Thank you. Um, I, I think for the, for the benefit of those who, who, who sorry, who are not from South Africa, who are not familiar with our legal framework. Um, our law protects a, a personal information held by also personal information of juristic persons, which is companies, which is unique, I think, in many respects. Yeah, I, I, I see so many. Um, in the back, the lady in the back, because I saw when... Yeah. 
and that's it. All right, it. thank you. My name is Teki Akweta. I'm coming from the Africa Digital Rights Hub. So, um, very, very interesting discussions. Um, but I have a peculiar question. Where data protection laws uh, typically justify indirect uh, collection of personal data, where that data has been made publicly available. And then also in some context in the laws, uh, particularly with uh, some of the jurisdictions across Africa, you have also further um, justification as compatible with the purpose for collection where data has been made publicly available. So how do we then um, juxtapose a lot of these or situate a lot of these discussions uh, within that context? Uh, because I'm, I'm sitting back and at some point I'm thinking, uh, is scraping then somehow justified under data protection laws? And if it is, I see some level of unfairness from the discussions coming up. So how would we uh, really look at the issues of um, indirect con uh, collection where personal data has been made publicly available and then also um, further processing which is justified as compatible with the purpose where personal data has been made public? Does anyone uh, from the panel want to get a stab at an answer? I saw. Yeah. You want? You, well, uh, this problem of compatible further use, but basically what you, what you mentioned is a problem which is one of the most pr problematic issues of European data protection law as well. So in that case, Africa is not different than, than Europe. Uh, when you talk about data scraping, for instance, and you can say maybe that's not compatible, but there's an uh, uh, emphasis should be always made to the fact that when you process personal data, you should comply with all the, all, all the requirements for personal data processing. For instance, and that's an important uh, notion you mentioned as well, is fairness. So fairness is always when you assess when you assess data processing when you assess cases, it's one of the main elements we always have to keep in mind. So is uh, so I think when you come to data scraping, you will, I will not say in general that it's unfair, but under certain circumstances, under certain circumstances, I definitely would say that it's unfair. Maybe that's an answer to your question. In any case, it's not so different than it is in Europe. So you can also look at all the scholarship under the GDPR, for instance, and other areas of the world as well, by the way. Thank you for that answer. Um, Pat, did you have a question? And, um, and we'll collect, we'll collect uh, yours as well. Yes, Betty, just um, as well, so think. it's more for Toby, really. Uh, Toby, yeah. I think you said that um, uh, platforms, websites have an obligation to take measures to detect and prevent data scraping. So I just wonder what your thoughts are on just a few days ago, there was uh, another service that was um, in the press that's designed to uh, detect and prevent data scraping, but not only to detect and prevent it, but to poison the data that the scrapers are collecting. So if that involves personal data, what would be your thoughts on that? in terms of the poisoning of personal data that, were, that data scrapers are seeking to harvest? Well, I, I would say that there's an issue here depending on how the data is being poisoned because this could lead to the generation of incorrect personal data. Let's say that my data is being scraped and then someone says, no, we're going to poison those data so it says something completely wrong about Toby. But when those data then used against me at a later time, point in time, then I certainly have an issue kind of defending myself against those poisonous data, poison data being used against me. So I don't think that is necessarily an ideal uh, solution in all cases, but if you're talking about it, not necessarily poisoning, but a, but a way to make the data not being identifiable, then that could certainly be uh, a way to move forward. So it kind of depends on what specific techniques you use in that regard. So that's, that is my initial reaction. 
Thank you for that. Stuart? Stuart Dresden from Practice Laws of Business. Thank you. Um, I just make one point about legal persons. Where the original first generation data protection laws, I think three, three countries or so covered legal persons, but then when they were revised, they dropped. I think Italy, Switzerland, Austria, I think. But when the laws were revised, they dropped the legal person coverage. Anyway, that's one point. That wasn't my main question, that's just observation. Um, my main thing is about the data for good. I'm glad he brought out that point. And it also refers back to the previous session. Um, the lawyer for um, AI, chat GBT AI, said that uh, the company was set up to do data for good and all the la large learning models was intended to do good for the world. So my question is for the regulators, if there was a certain data scraping example which was done by a, a company which was intending to do things for good, like helping children read or something like that, how would, would you treat it differently from data scraping for a company which was trying to sell porn or, or do something terrible? So in other words, is it just the context important when regulators look at the same activity? Is, is that question clear for the regulators? Yeah, okay, thank you. Who would want to start an answer? Um. I'll just note that there is a uh, woman considered quite a hero, uh, a student now professor named Laura Adelson, who was scraping Facebook against their objections to do research to try to prove you know, misinformation or other problems on, uh, on Facebook. And so then Facebook you know, blocked her and said you know, she was violating their, their, their rules, she wasn't doing it properly, and it became quite a you know, celebrated case, but she had lots of support because people thought that what she was doing was, you know, quite, quite meritorious. But it was scraping against the platform's uh, intentions, uh, you know, for, for a good cause. So does context matter? I think context always matters. It always matters when you look, when you have to decide on cases. Context always matters, and the purpose for which you do certain activities always matter. But I don't say that that allows data scraping in certain circumstances. I cannot give. A, on this respect, I think I have to uh, disappoint you. I cannot give a general a theoretic answer on on data scraping. But of course, context matters, and of course, there are situations like the situation mentioned by Jules, where uh, some activities are completely justifiable. But the general answer, whether or not data scraping as such is a forbidden activity, I cannot give you. I will not give you. Do you want to add something? Yeah, just add. So, so at least under European data protection law, if you don't want to gain an individual consent, in order to get their data, or it's not mandated by some, by some legislation that you're subject to, then essentially you would need to balance the interest at stake. What is the company's interest, and what is the interest of the data subject, right? And uh, in, in Europe, the, the regulators have, have held, actually for a very long time, even before the current legislation, that the nature of the interest of the company will actually play a major role. And as an example, regulators have said in, in the guidelines, uh, that if, if the interest is of, let's say, a public good, if it is something that benefits society as a whole, if it benefits you know, certain groups in society, if it is actually even validated by legislation, then th those purposes will actually be quite uh, compelling when you balance these interests. So for sure, I think there are use cases that could be acceptable um, and, 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 you know, disinformation, perhaps, you know, that there, are, there are certain use cases, so I, I certainly wouldn't rule that out. And, indeed, the question was very good, because I think that hmm. the nature, but also the origin of the interests do play a substantive role. Thank you very much. I think I want to go back to Teki's question about yes. further processing. Please. Just in terms of um, how it applies in the South African law, because uh, further processing will not be incompatible if um, the information is in the public record or it's been deliberately made um, accessible by the data subject. And the, the test there in South Africa, which we are still grappling with, because the question is, what does making the record accessible in the public domain, what does that mean? What if you, you have to pay a fee to access that record? What if you have to create a password 
to access that record? Can you say that it is available, it is accessible in the public domain? Mm -hmm. I think those are the questions. Mm -hmm. And deliberately made public by the data subject. People think that uh, there is a view that uh, information on the, on, the, on the internet, you have deliberately made it public. But the question is, if I put my, my photos on, on Facebook and they are only available to my friends, have I made it deliberately uh, uh, accessible to the public? And also, if I come to this conference and somebody takes my photo without my permission, and they put that photo on the website of the conference, have I made my personal information deliberately accessible? Who bears the owners? I think the owners is on the responsible party or the controller. Those are some of the issues that we're grappling with, I think, within our jurisdiction. Thank you very much. Um, I think that I am extraordinarily grateful for all of your time. Uh, um, thank you so much for being here uh, at the truly last panel of, of the day. Uh, I see there were a couple of other questions, but we are very happy to 